Oriental Hall, 22 Reed Street. Today is August 9, 2017. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and beepers. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card at the desk outside of Spectre Hall. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago. Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Commissioner Besser. Here. Commissioner Cantor. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. Commissioner De La Here. Commissioner Dweck. Here. Commissioner Eady. Here. Commissioner Efron. Here. Commissioner Knight. Here. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marin. Here. Commissioner Ortiz. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, July 26, 2017. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The minutes are approved. Scheduling on calendar numbers 1 through 26, we have resolutions for adoption scheduling Wednesday, August 23rd, 2017, for a public hearing to be held in Spectre Hall, 22 Reed Street at 9.30. On the resolution, Aye. all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the votes on page 279. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 27, Community District 11, N170440 BDX, in the matter of an application concerning the formation of the Morris Park Business Improvement District. For a favorable report on calendar number 27, Chair Lago. Yes. Commissioner Besser. Yes. Commissioner Cantor. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Efron. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 27. Borough Brooklyn, calendar number 28, Community District 1, N170369 ZAK. In the matter of an application for the grant of an authorization concerning the Domino Flexible Field for adoption on calendar number 28, Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Commissioner Besser. Yes. Commissioner Cantor. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Efron. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Calendar number 28 has been adopted. <laughs> Borough of Manhattan, calendar numbers 29 and 30. Community District 5, calendar number 29, N170062ZAM. Calendar number 30, N170363ZAM. And the matter of application for the grant of authorizations concerning 10 East 30th Street parking renewal. For adoption on calendar numbers 29 and 30. Chair Lago. Yes. Commissioner Besser. Yes. Commissioner Cantor. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Efron. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Calendar numbers 30, 29 and 30 have been adopted. Calendar number 31, Borough of Manhattan, Community District 11, C170066 PCM, and the matter of an application for the site selection acquisition of property concerning the New York Police Department's 107th Street parking facility for a favorable report on calendar number 31. Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chair, um, Commissioner Besser. Yes. Commissioner Cantor. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Efron. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. A fair report has been adopted on calendar number 31. <coughs> calendar numbers 32 and 33. Community District 2, number 32, C170373 ZMR, number 33, N170374 ZRR, and the matter of applications for zoning text and zoning map amendments concerning the East Shore Special Coastal Risk District. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 32 and 33, Chair Lago. Yes. Commissioner Besser. Yes. Commissioner Cantor. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Efron. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 32 and 33. 
Calendar number 34 in the Borough of Staten Island, Community District 4, N170144 ZCR, in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 134 Milden Avenue for adoption on calendar number 34, Chair Lago. Yes. Commissioner Besser. Yes. Commissioner Cantor. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Efron. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Calendar number 34 has been adopted. Borough Staten Island, calendar number 35, Community District 1, N170349, ZCR. In the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning Brighton Avenue and Fairmount Avenue for adoption on calendar number 35, yes. Chair Lago. Yes. Commissioner Besser. Yes. Commissioner Cantor. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Efron. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marin. <coughs> Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Calendar number 35 has been adopted. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 285. Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 36. Community districts 10 and 11, C160253, MMX. Of public hearing in the matter of an application for an amendment to the city map concerning the Westchester Avenue Bridge. Um, if I could ask Tom Ellsroff. Tom Osroth. I am with the firm ACOM. I am representing New York City DOT Division of Bridges on the application for a legal grade change for the Westchester Avenue Bridge. Uh, just to briefly just go through the project, the location itself, the bridge is located in the uh, southeast section of the Bronx. Uh, the project itself, Westchester Avenue, the Mr. Osroth, if I could ask that you take the microphone because oh, sure. we're okay. broadcasting. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Just the, the orientation of the roadway, Westchester Avenue, it travels southwest and northeast to the, pro, to the project area. The uh, roadway itself travels over the Hutchinson River Parkway. Uh, it's also bounded by the Holland Parkway to the north and the, and the Cross, Bronx, uh, yes, Cross Bronx Expressway to the south. Uh, just in general, the project itself in the close caption has the Hutch Metro Center goes to the north area, Tremont. Used to the south. The project itself, the need for the project stems from, uh, I guess as a lot of people might have heard through the various reports, there has been a lot of truck accidents on the structure. The structure is only 12, uh, 10 feet 2 inches high from the Westchester Avenue Bridge elevation to the Hutchinson River Parkway elevation. That's probably the main, uh, the main catapult of the design itself. So with the New York City DOT, what we've been doing is designing, redesigning the bridge really rehabbing it, uh, we're putting back exactly what's there, not changing any of the curb lines, not changing any of the sidewalk dimensions or <clears throat> lane left, lane widths, whatnot. Um, so that's really the, the big issue. Also, the structure itself is old. It's built basically in uh, 1941, so it's over 75 years old. Some of the recent bridge ratings on the structure are deficient, with ratings of uh, in and around four, which really need repair. So this is really one of the projects with the city uh, DOT, Division of Bridges, is on their hit list to get uh, repaired and rehabilitated as quick as possible. There is one uh, noticeable uh, aspect of the bridge that I'd just like to bring out is that the number six line for the MTA travels above the bridge and it is connected directly to a structure, not the abutments, not the center pier, but actually to our, our structure itself, which adds a complexity to the structure and to the construction act construction process for the project. <clears throat> uh, the objectives of this project obviously is just to make sure we improve our vertical clearance underneath the bridge. So with the existing 10 foot 2 in both corners, which is you know, by far way, way under what it should be, we're going with the Ashton required minimum of 20 of 12 feet 6 inches. <clears throat> so, the, so the bridge is being raised. But we're also maintaining 14 feet of clearance between the bridge, uh, sorry, between Westchester Avenue and the uh, viaduct structure for the transit. Questions for Mr. Ellsroth? 
Yes, Commissioner Efron. Thank you for coming. Is the bridge going to be painted that bright green that we see? Yes, it is. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Delos. Uh, you, you started to say something that I was going to ask, and that is, is there a minimum clearance between the bridge and the MTA structure, and will that, how will that change as a result? Right now, it's, the minimum is 14-1. What we're actually doing with the project to get the clearance underneath is to really raise, is really to decrease the width of the structure. <clears throat> so right now, you have larger beams, which are roughly six feet. <clears throat> There's 14 of them. We're going to replace those with 20 smaller beams, so we're shallowing the structure depth. <clears throat> what that allows us to do is obviously bring up the elevation. We're also modifying the, ele the profile slightly on top, where there's going to be really a four-inch increase on more or less the western edge. That's the maximum increase. What that does, and what we can still maintain, is a 14-foot clearance to the fence underneath the structure. So working with transit, they approved that that was allowable in that amount. Understanding the possible complexities involved, was there an opportunity to lower the roadbed itself? Yes, back in uh, 2007, we actually worked on that, that design. <clears throat> Got to a point, uh, there, it's a tidal area. If you can see, there's a water body almost coming through here, which is tidal, which is somewhat close. To reduce the roadway roughly two and a half feet at that point, there becomes a tidal influence where the, the project would have had to been done over a weekend period. It could have been done, just that there's a chance that if you're doing this, and let's say you get a rain event on a weekend when you have a closure, there could have been a, a situation where next Monday, when you're supposed to open up that bridge Friday morning, set, like sun, really Monday morning at 5 o'clock, you may have a pond out there. So again, everyone weighed, weighed the options, and really, you know, with DEP's in, input too, it really, we just went, went against it. I'll leave it to the experts. Thank you. <laughs> right. Yes, Commissioner Kent. Thank you. With regard to your last comment, uh, I understand the logic behind it, but in terms of dollars and cents, it would have been a heck of a lot easier to do as the, as the chair, as my colleague has requested, would it not? Actually, the price came out fairly consistent. I think, uh, again, we're going back with dollars from 2008 and 2009. It was, say, roughly in the mid-30, like $30 million, $35 million. To cut out a piece of the roadbed well, below? Yes, right, extent. because you have to redo the, the, all of the drainage, too, with it. Um, DP at the time was thinking, we, based on the flooding aspect and the tidal, in, in turn, uh, uh, tidal influence coming in, we may also have to have a pump chain, a pumping chain at a station. Okay. So that put the price at roughly, roughly 32 back in those dollars and 32 million, of which now the, the project was, uh, was at 43. Okay. And so. Now you're shallowing up the, de the deck. My question is, is there, is there going to be a perceptible vibration? Excuse me? Is, will there be perceptible vibration as they go over the bridge now that it's shallow? Actually, the way we have to design it, because the structure, the, the transit structure ties directly into uh, the, the girders. Instead, right now, there's two girders on the bridge that support the, the structural, the columns for the transit structure. We're actually stiffening that with four. Uh, but so actually, really, the stiffness factor, I believe, is actually stiffer than it was. But it can't be too stiff because of the motion on the bridge. It's, it's a little bit of give and take. Yeah, but it's not going to feel like a bouncy bridge. No, no. If anything, it's, it's going to, it should move less. Okay. Because it is so safe. You've, done, you've done analysis, I assume. Okay. Commissioner Levin. Um, the community board has some recommendations about the condition um, after the bridge replacement, specifically about landscaping, mm -hmm. um, I guess, on the, the staging area, and about uh, street lighting being incorporated into the bridge design and extending uh, on either end. Are those features you're able to accommodate? Yeah, this, the lighting goes back to Waters Place and also all new lighting to, uh, I guess, uh, Hudson River Parkway East on the lighting side, and the structure of the, the park area, that was stipulated by parks in their approval. If we had to re, we have the, whatever location they, that was being used for the laydown area and storage area, had to be put back into its original condition at the end of construction. Okay, good, thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Okay. There are no other speakers. Um, who have signed up on this item, but if there is anyone in the audience who would be interested, please raise your hand. If not, the public hearing is closed. Bearer of the Bronx, calendar numbers 37 and 38, Muni District 10, 
Calendar number 37C170413 ZMX. Calendar number 38N170414 ZRX. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning the special Harlem Waterfront District expansion. We do not have any speakers signed up for these items, but if there is anyone in the audience who would be interested, please raise your hand. If not, then looking at the commissioners, the <laughs> public hearing is closed. I would ask a question, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> of the empty podium. <laughs> Borough of the Bronx, calendar number 39, Community District 10, N180015 PXX, a public hearing in the matter of a notice of intent to acquire office space for the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Our first speaker is Brian Switzer. And I'll also note that Dale Lazarson from DCAS is available for questions as well. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Brian Spitzer. I'm the Director of Operations at the Tax and Limousine Commission. I'm speaking here this morning in favor of the TLC's desire to acquire 35,000 square feet of office space at 2500 Halsey Street in the Bronx. Uh, this lease space will be used to temporarily house our Uniform Services Bureau Enforcement Division um, and its supporting departments for the next five years. Um, as our city-owned building at 2455 EQ West in Woodside, Queens is undergoing um, extensive rehabilitation. As described in the proposal, um, due to the poor soil conditions at the property, our administrative offices uh, that encompass half of the building will be torn down, an entire parking lot will be removed, the soil will be removed and compacted, refilled with proper materials, and a new building will be built in its place. Uh, like I said, this is an extensive project, and we need to remove all of our fleet vehicles and a majority of our staff from the property to make it happen. Um, 2500 Halsey Street will serve as the central dispatch uh, point for all of TLC's enforcement personnel. Um, these are a group of individuals, inspectors, um, that ensure the high standards and conditions of our TLC um, or higher industries citywide. Uh, they are the field enforcement personnel that go out and issue summonses um, to yellow medallion taxis, borough taxis, livery cars, black cars, limousines, commuter vans, and ambulettes. Um, these officers are the ones that go out every day and make sure that the uh, vehicle that you hail on the street or call on your phone or use an app to uh, book um, are safe and inspected. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them regarding our enforcement division. Questions from the commission? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we're setting a speed record. Um, we're saving up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a useful ad admonition, Commissioner Levin. Um, Mr. Switzer, was the um, any questions for Ms. Lazarson? Okay. Yes, of course, Commissioner Eady. I, I had oh, to. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the building that we're moving, the 2500 Halsey Street, if I understand correctly, it's owned by the city of New York, but the, there's the, the builder of it operates the building or leased it from the city. Is that correct? No, uh, actually. Oh, it is. Okay. Uh, but you do have a good recollection of a prior history. I think, way before my time, so don't quote me, I think at some point in time there was some kind of a city ownership, but that was a very long time ago. Okay. The property was then, um, it was... I'm not sure who the original owner was and where it was sold, but it was sold to a developer who changed it at the time from an industrial property to uh, deliver this office building. There was a, um, a corporation in the building, the entire building. Um, it's about 300,000 square feet, give or take. And they vacated. Uh, they didn't necessarily leave the New York City area. I think they moved to a larger space. So the building became vacant. Recently, the city of New York, uh, with this commission's approval, placed HRA into a portion of that building as a tenant. Uh, and um, also in the building, um, uh, there, is, there is one other tenant um, in the building. And now we are taking uh, for TLC on a temporary basis, the ground floor. Okay. So I think sometime a long time ago, there may have been some city ownership interest, potentially even an EDC participation. But currently it's privately owned. It is privately okay. owned, yes. OK, thank you. Yes, good memory. 
Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Lazarson. Thank you. We don't have any other speakers registered, but if there is anyone here who would want to be heard on this item, please raise your hand. Okay, this public hearing is closed. Borough of Brooklyn, county number 40, Community District 2, N180016, PXK, a public hearing in the matter of an intent to acquire office space for the New York City Fire Department. And from FDNY, we have Michael Hannon registered as a speaker, and again, Ms. Lazarson, available to answer questions. Lago, I'm not quite sure about the delay. I know that Michael Hannon was on his way from Brooklyn. Uh, so if you'd like, I can answer questions. I can do a little opening statement if needed um, to follow up to I, Monday's session. I'm not sure if it's a train delay or what's happening, but apparently a number of our speakers are not there yet. Okay, I would ask um, our general counsel if it is possible to lay over this item at the public hearing until the speaker, until the fire department arrives. Okay, so we will just move on, and if you wouldn't mind waiting as well until That's Mr. Hannon right. arrives. Absolutely. We'll see you momentarily. <laughs> this item will return for second call. <laughs> Borough of Brooklyn, county number 41, CD8, C150382, PQK, a public hearing in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning the Albany Avenue Neighborhood Senior Center. Our speaker on this item is Claudette Macy with Jason Ortiz of DCAS available to answer questions. Good morning, everyone. We have some boards we're trying to put up here. My name is Claudette Macy. I am the executive director of Fort Green Council, who is the sponsor of Albany Neighborhood Senior Center, funded by the Department for the Aging. And I'm here in support of renewing the lease for a 20-year term to continue to house Albany Neighborhood Senior Center. Uh, Fort Green Council has been in this business for 44 years, and we've been sponsoring the Albany Neighborhood Center for 12 years now. And uh, we, the program is open Monday through Fridays, and we serve nutritious meal in a congregate setting. Breakfast and learn is served <coughs> five days a week, and dinner is served twice a week. We serve over 200 meals per month. We also provide case assistance, information and referral, arts and culture, technology, physical exercise, health management, nutrition education, telephone reassurance, recreational, education, and cultural activities, also trips and transportation for the seniors. This program serves anyone who is 60 years young and older. <laughs> and um, there is a, the Albany housing is right across the street from 196 Albany, oh, they didn't put the pictures out. So we do lots of outreach to reach out, especially to anyone that's 60 and over in the Albany houses. And we've done, uh, the last mailing we did, about 70,000, and we target each person in that community, 60 and over, and that has increased the attendance, especially from the residents in the Albany uh, housing. We also, our Albany is used as a cooling site during the emergency. Whenever the city declares a heat wave, then we use that site as a cooling center where not only 60 years old, but anyone in the community can come there and keep cool. On those days, we have extended hours, <coughs> depending on what the mayor says, if it's until 8 or 9. So I'm willing to take any questions. Yes, Commissioner Efron. Thank you. Um, a mailing of 70,000 seems like it should yield um, many seniors. Uh, how many are currently coming to this space on a daily or weekly basis? Because 200 meals, um, 
at seven meals a week is really a rather small number. Are there more seniors coming? Okay, first question. The 70,000, I should clarify, it's throughout the agency. We sponsor 13 centers. I see. Throughout Brooklyn, so that community did not have 70,000 for the mailing. <laughs> Secondly, we open five days a week and only two days a week for dinner. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have, in a given day, we have like 100 to 125. When there's a birthday party or a special event, we have like 150 to celebrate. When there's a trip, we have sometimes 160, 170. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Um, I spoke to Lee Boyce, who should be here from DIFTA, okay. and I don't see her, so she would have a more in-depth uh, of it. But as far as I know, some sidewalk have cracks, cracks which we have testified, that needs to be repaired. There were some benches newly installed in front of the building, but there's still need for improvement for making like safe pathways down where the seniors exit. So yes, the other detail uh, Difta Lee Boys would have that information. Well, I guess my question for you as the person who has to manage operations within that building, are there conditions in the building that you would like to see improved? Um, the lighting, and right now it's the lighting. The elevator was fixed, and we were told, which is a fact, once the lease is signed, that then they can move forward with whatever else needs to be. The community board raised the issue of the elevator, which you indicate has been repaired. Yeah, um, it's but also flooding in the basement, is that a problem? Yeah, those were history. Okay. And those were taken care of. Of course the elevator is like overnight, anytime it can break down, but as now it's working properly and the flooding has ceased. Other questions? Good. Commissioner Dwight. So in general the, the uh, landlord has been uh, on top of re and responsive to your uh, request for, <coughs> it's been easy to work with the landlord. Have you found them to be responsive to, to any um, <coughs> improvements that needed to be done? Um, you know, I personally don't deal, unlike my other sites, directly with the landlord. So, DIFTA, we let DIFTA know what's happening, and they reach out to him because I think it's a cooperation or something. But in general, and he ha yes, those two things were fixed. <coughs> And is there any, so is there, has there been a time that there's been an item that you've mentioned or a problem and then it's not gotten fixed or? No, not no. to my knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. We also have Jason Ortiz from DCAS available in case there are any um, questions. <coughs> Good morning again. I apologize. I'm not quite sure uh, what's happening. Uh, I am a colleague of Jason Ortiz. He's with our department. May I stand in to answer any questions? For yep, if you would fill in the card oh, afterwards. Yes. yes, thank you. Questions for Ms. Lazarson. <coughs> yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Um, uh, recently we've been discussing um, some of the exterior improvements, and I know that um, Borough President Adams raised this issue as well um, with respect to tree plantings and um, sidewalk conditions. Um, do you have any input on sort of whether those, um, whether there are improvements to the exterior that will be included here or if there's an opportunity for that? Yeah, so with the actual lease renewal with the owner and the scope of work, I don't believe the exterior improvements uh, that you've identified described, more beautification improvements are included. However, I do know that Lee Boys has started the dialogue about certain exterior beautification programs. So if I may, uh, we can follow up <coughs> on an email from DIFTA responding to that question. Yes, thank you. Okay, that will be helpful at the post hearing follow up to have information from DIFTA. Absolutely, certainly, thank you. Okay, those are the only speakers signed up on this matter. If there's anyone in the audience who wants to join, raise your hand. The public hearing is closed. Thank you. Borough of Brooklyn, County Number 42, Community District 4, C170352PQK, 
a public hearing in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property located at 930 Flushing Avenue. Our first speaker is Henry Jackson. Uh, hi, uh, so my name is Henry Jackson. I'm Deputy Commissioner at um, New York City Emergency Management, uh, and I'm joined by my colleague uh, from DCAS, Dale Lasserson. I uh, said uh, this is an application to acquire additional space at our current warehouse, which we call the Emergency Support Center. Um, it is located in Community District 4 in Brooklyn at 930 Flushing Avenue. Uh, I'm going to present who we are, what we do at the Emergency Support Center, why we're growing, and why we seek to expand at this location. Uh, founded in 1996 as a mayoral agency, New York City Emergency Management was granted departmental status in November 2001. Our mission, has, our, our mission is fourfold, uh, preparing the city for emergencies, educating and informing the public about preparedness, uh, coordinating emergency response and recovery, and collecting and disseminating information. The Emergency Support Center plays a critical role in all four of these missions. Our goal at the Emergency Support Center is to have a supply of anything that can be needed through the first few hours of an emergency. Uh, then we need uh, vehicles and equipment to move those supplies. So we keep a variety of vehicles, uh, as well as our command vehicles that we use when we set up in the field. Um, we have generators, light towers, tractors, trailers, forklifts, and other specialty vehicles. Uh, for supplies, we store cots and blankets, food and water, and other supplies to set up shelter operations. We keep dust masks, harps, cones, tools, shovels, sandbags, supplies to set up staging areas in the field. And we have a small staff at the warehouse to maintain and deploy these resources. Uh, we were thrust into the warehousing business after 9-11 when we had to take over a pier on the Lower East Side to manage many of the logistical supplies that were needed to respond to that day's tragic events. We operated that location until 2006 when we relocated off the water's edge. Uh, to the current location at 930 Flushing Avenue. Our initial support center operation was developed and designed based on the after action items from September 11th. Fifteen years later, we are improving our operation to take into account the lessons of Sandy. Much work has been done, and this expansion is one of the final recommendations to be implemented. Uh, there are three things that are driving the growth uh, at this facility. One is the addition of a backup emergency operations center to ensure the city's resilience in times of crisis. This additional space will also give the city continuity space uh, that can be used for other smaller emergencies. Secondly, the Sandy response was largely a logistics operation that involved the creation of various task forces to focus on dewatering, generators, food and water, uh, et cetera. Additional workspace, office, and conference rooms are required to support these operations. And finally, the need for additional warehouse space to surge up during emergencies was a key recommendation from the Sandy, Sandy After Action Report. So, with this mission, we set off to purchase a facility that could support our proposed operation, and we had three criteria. Uh, we had to be out of all the hurricane evacuation zones. It had to be at least 200,000 square feet. It had to be centrally located so we could respond to all five boroughs quickly. Working with DCAS and the real estate broker, a search was commenced. And while many properties were considered, at the end of the day, we were not able to find anything that was suitable, that was for sale, and that met our criteria. So we are here today with a long-term lease for this critical facility at 930 Flushing Avenue that will allow us to continue to stand ready to respond for the next couple of decades. I'd be happy Thank to you. take your questions. Questions for Mr. Jackson. Yes, Commissioner Delos. Uh, Mr. Jackson, thanks for being here. Um, there's a couple points um, that both the community board made in their recommendation and also the borough president in his. Um, I mean, you, you started to speak about the challenge of trying to find something to acquire, to buy outright versus lease. If you could maybe speak to that some more, and there's also some concern um, about the price that's, that's being paid for the lease. Sure. So uh, our original intent was to purchase a facility. Um, uh, and so, again, we had this criteria uh, working with the brokers. Um, and, and if you take a map of the city of New York and you put the evacuation zones on it and you put the manufacturing zones on it, there's not much left. Um, and so uh, these guys did a block by block search, literally looking at building footprints, knocking on doors to see if things were available. We did our own sort of rogue searches. Um, we scoured the city for spaces uh, that would be available. Um, but, we, but that requirement to be out of a hurricane evacuation zone is, is very important. I mean, we have to be operating during a hurricane. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and we can't be the person that explains why we're there uh, with, with all our supplies underwater. So, 
Um, so it was our intent. We could not find anything that was available to buy. And, um, and so this is where we are. If, if I might, I mean, sure. and, and perhaps this is um, for Ms. Lazarson after you. Um, I'm just wondering if there was any discussion whatsoever of a lease with an option to purchase with uh, the owner. Right. I, I wasn't directly involved in the negotiations with the owner, uh, with the owner, but but we tried everything we could. That I understand to, to buy that place um, and, uh, and and to buy any place because obviously it makes sense. We want to own it ourselves. Commissioner Cantor. Thank you. Um, what's how long is a long-term lease? Uh, it's 20 years. And they're renewable? Uh, yes, there is a 10-year renewable on top of that. Okay, and is this a triple net? Is it what? Triple net lease? Triple net lease, yes. <laughs> so anything and everything you guys want to do, you do on your own? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Dwight. Um, thank you. Going to the borough president and the community board's recommendations, uh, there's a couple of recommendations uh, I'll point out to you. The rest, I guess, I'll ask Dale about. Uh, one of them is that the NYPD has a parking facility a few blocks away, and they are, uh, it would free up NYCHA space for development of affordable housing. With, with the relocation of that parking facility, considering the fact that your center is primarily in use and during an emergency, which we uh, hope to have minimal, uh, of, would that impede your ability to to um, to carry out your uh, your your command? Uh, well, I, we're going to take a look at it. We reached out to them. We're going to go do a site visit. Um, we'd have to see how much space there is because the, the warehouse does operate on a day to day basis. There are people there receiving supplies. We're moving things in, in and out all the time, and, and they're, we're also hosting the urban search and rescue team. There, so and they're in there on a weekly basis. So we, we'd have to work it out. But we did say we would uh, have a conversation with PSA, and we're setting that up. We've already had one conversation. With them, and, so. and the next question and the recommendation of the borough president uh, that I'm going to address with you would be the uh, recommendation for a green roof, blue green roof, solar panel, or urban agriculture. Um, I mean, a ma an emergency management, you'd want to have a solar backup. I sure, so. sure, yeah. We're, uh, our headquarters in Brooklyn was the first LEED certified headquarters in, in, uh, among the city agencies. And so we're committed to that, and we said we'd be willing to do anything that we can work out with the landlord, and that's consistent with DCAS's program, which we currently participate in. So, so will, you be, will, will you commit that the agency will be exploring those options? We will, we will definitely explore them. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Arpa. I guess I hadn't fully appreciated that you've been occupying this space already. Yes. Since 2006. That's right. So perhaps this is for Ms. Lazarson, but um, in the course of your consideration for uh, space to acquire by purchase, um, once you determined that you couldn't, were there other leases that you looked at, or was this the only lease that was contemplated? I'm just trying to understand a little bit the sense of the market rate, right. because, it, or I should say, the, the rate that at least was presented to us, which we don't normally see, but since it's out there, we feel, I think some of us feel it's our public obligation to at least pursue this line of sure. questioning. Sure. Um, we didn't get, we weren't offered even any space that was suitable for lease, um, except this space. I mean, all the other spaces we looked for that were for sale, that, that were for sale were not um, suitable. Um, and even things that were for lease were, were, were not suitable. And this is literally, you know, and again, I don't know the market um, uh, and how that works, but, uh, you know, we spent a couple of years doing this search and we ran around the city looking at all sorts of stuff. I'm not sure why this is the only one that was available, but, but you're right, we're there. Um, uh, uh, and so it's a little bit easier, but, but our intent was to get out. Thanks. Sure. Other questions? Yes, yes Commissioner Cantor. Thank you. Do you have a termination clause? Uh, yes, there's an escape clause at, uh, I think, 11 years, 17 years. OK, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Our next speaker is our much. most frequent <laughs> presenter today, Ms. Lazarson. <laughs> Yes, I am here to answer some questions about the property and the transaction, perhaps some that have already been asked. Yes, Commissioner Dweck. Oh, thank you. So, hi, Dale. Welcome hi. back again. Thank you. Um, so, going back to the price uh, that is indicated, uh, so first of all, it's unusual for us to see the pricing 
And uh, that being said, I think that the pricing is, is above market, and I understand the unique uh, situation that we're in with this space, but it's a disincentive for other, uh, for other landlords in the area to, to rent below that market rate if we're establishing that market rate. So A, how did, the, the, that, how did we get to that rate, and how did uh, it become a public uh, uh, part of the public uh, process? And uh, then B, has the agency, has DCAS looked at uh, acquiring the site through eminent domain or, or any other uh, available means that we legally have since we're pretty much paying the price for it over many years? Okay, so three, three points to that question. Let me start with the last. As the city of New York, eminent domain and active condemnation is always on the table. Whether or not the acquisition of a site through that mechanism is appropriate, whether or not the need for the site would rise to the level of exercising the city's right um, is not something that DCAS alone would make a decision on. That is uh, a very significant real estate action. So suffice to say that as the city of New York, that right is always on the table. Like to leave it there. With respect to why uh, the dollar per square foot, the financials of this transaction entered into the land use dialogue, um, I can't speak directly. I think at some point in time, um, with the public interest in this particular application, um, uh, there just may have been an exchange of the value of the property community's interest in the general area. This is in the enhanced commercial corridor. So it perhaps just came up uh, in the course of dialogue and um, unfortunately perhaps uh, you know, just continued through the land use process as opposed to a sidebar conversation. So that is why it is in front of you. To the question as to the dollar per square foot. Yes. Uh, in the mid-30s right now, manufacturing and warehouse space, I would say it is on the higher side. Having said that, um, there are deals that are trading that are just shy of that, and then there are others that are much less than that. But all of them are somewhere in the upper teens and low 20s at this juncture that we're finding. The transaction that we have negotiated, however, double-edged sword, perhaps it's unfortunate, fortunate. Bushwick is uh, no longer an emerging market. Rents have escalated tremendously in a very short period of time. When this site was originally um, considered for the expansion, I don't think that the rents were as high. But as our processes of thorough due diligence to look at all sites continued, uh, so did the increasing market of Bushwick. So we find ourselves in the mid-30s. I don't want to hark back on a prior dialogue with this commission, but depending upon who's measuring the space, we really are hovering around the $30 range. Yeah, so again, it is on the higher side. Now having said that, um, unfortunate to be having to lease a property at the peak of the market, and then the alternative is that is a very quiet market that we all recognized in 2008, and I don't think we want to go back there. So with respect to the impact of leasing at this rate and other properties in the market, the landlord is achieving through the city of New York a starting annual rate of $11 million for our take of the whole property. That is probably what owners are going to be looking in the area to comp against. And depending upon the market review of this asset and how it is measured, it's very likely that the $36 that you are presented with is not going to show up. It's very likely that it will be in the lower 30s, potentially high 20s. There is a REBNY standard of measurement for the industrial space, and I suspect that other owners in the area will be using that standard. So more than likely, again, it will be an annual aggregate that they are looking at, and then each owner will look at the square footage as the owner of this property presents it. Um, beyond that, this particular project is not an economic development project. 
This is the acquisition of space for a very critical need, as described by Henry Jackson for the New York City Emergency <coughs> Management Agency and its services citywide. Thank you. Commissioner Cantor. Thank you. <coughs> I don't know exactly how to put the question. The first two items, uh, I found that your response was not as clear as it has been in the past. Uh, and I'm wondering who's putting the powder on the window. Uh, I understand that you're, not, you're reluctant to speak to those issues. But can you give us more as to why you are reluctant to speak to those issues? Certainly. Uh, and thank you for being gracious. <coughs> I'm not reluctant to speak about a matter of eminent domain and condemnation. Because it is what it is. That action for the city of New York is never off the table. It is a city right. However, it is not DCAS's place to determine if that act is appropriate. Not DCAS's sole position. That would be a collective decision by many stakeholders. Um, and I think, uh, I come from the perspective, if you always have a right, there is no need to keep stating it, particularly in the public forum. We have a tremendous amount of very successful relationships with the private sector. This is a private lease. Is <clears throat> Do we have experience with this landlord? We have some experience with this landlord, yes. Which has been, I assume, satisfactory. Uh, he's a tough guy. He, the partnership is a tough guy. Uh, I would say that um, the opportunity to have the space that we need for the New York City Emergency Management Agency, um, yes, we have the space. So he's, from that perspective, it's good. From a business guy, he stands his ground, and, and sometimes as negotiations go, it can be difficult. Uh, but overall, uh, as you asked, this is primarily a triple net lease. The ownership does have some responsibility for structure, for exterior, et cetera. Um, as, as any industrial lease might expect. So we do have involvement with him. The conversation is polite. It's professional. I wouldn't necessarily say that we're having lunch with this guy. <laughs> but they have, they have something we want, and uh, we have something that they want. So we're hoping to uh, continue to meet at the table when needed with professional dialogue. It just seems to me, particularly in the environment in which we live today, that um, openness is something that's looked for or looked at. And we're talking about a sole source for 200,000 square foot area. Big building. Uh, is this something that if you continue, when I say you, I don't mean you. If the city continues on this path, are we going to be in a fake news conversation? I certainly hope not. never before heard the lunch with this guy standard. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Delahouze. I'm, de I'm, I'm just struck by, one, the length of time that you all searched for an appropriate space. Um, the fact that in the time period that that happened, that the market shifted dramatically in the neighborhood. And, you know, I personally wonder to what extent the city's announcement of the Bushwick rezoning contributed uh, to that potential, to that shift. But the question I really have has to do with whether or not other agencies have come to DCAS with similar parameters in terms of need. Um, you know, such a large space, long-term need out of a flood zone. Perhaps that's very unique to this agency given the particular use. Um, and whether or not uh, we need to think more long-term about these kinds of needs um, and, and plan for them, given the amount of time that the agency put into trying to find an appropriate space. And the fact that um, we've had a pretty significant decrease in manufacturing square footage overall in the city. So I, I don't know if it's fair to ask you that question, but I, to me it raises that question. Sure, I can respond to that in part. Uh, you're absolutely correct that citywide we have seen a diminishing supply of industrial space. One caveat, the New York City Office of Emergency Management, this requirement was not about a flood zone. It was about an evacuation zone. Mm -hmm. So there okay. is a difference, um, which goes to answering another question. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
we have had other agencies with requirements that have narrow parameters for the protection of their operations. Other operations that have been in front of you mm -hmm. in Southwest Sunset Park, 4312 2nd Avenue, mm -hmm. home to the New York NYC. Police Department, right. property right. clerk storage, and central records. Right. That relocation effort was significant coming out of very damaged facilities after Sandy, over on Kingsland, et cetera. We also have the New York City Police Department, again, with the property clerk, um, with a very significant <coughs> transaction underway in, in, uh, in good dialogue, friendly dialogue, in Queens for a centralized, consolidated operation, which matters should be in front of you if we're lucky this year. Um, so the answer is yes. We do have other agencies that do have critical needs with very um, restrictive parameters for the site search. Yes, uh, NYCEM is not the only one. If I may. No. But again, to the extent that that, that, that long-term analysis has been done and that planning analysis has been done from the agency's perspective and it kind of limits the kind of areas in the city that would be appropriate for that use, I, I'm just wondering if we shouldn't be thinking about increasing density in those manufacturing spaces to allow for inc those uses to be accommodated. Like that's part of my question from our, from our perspective. It's a great observation and I will also offer this, that we are underway and have been um, neophyte stages, but now we're, we're getting underway particularly with the Department of Transportation, who also would fall into this category, um, primarily because of their need for arterial access when they're out servicing all of our roadways. Um, we are looking at an overall industrial strategy. Exactly. And that industrial strategy actually started a little while ago, I think even before my time. I started with the City of New York in 2014. So, yep, so um, that advances, it becomes more challenging. Um, and I will offer that with industrial space and the diminishing supply, we very carefully partner with the agencies for their requirements because, going to your point, real estate cannot always solve for the requirements. So sometimes it becomes the dialogue at the table. How can the operations be modified or adjusted right. 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 without compromise to them? Right. Yeah. So a large strategy that you're suggesting, that is part of the conversation. Yes. Thank you. Chris Sharkman. Thank you. Um, and, and you have answered a lot of questions I had, and I understand why OEM is a special uh, need given the evacuation zones. But when you talk about the diminishing supply of industrial space, that really is a primary land use issue for us as we contemplate industrial space for a variety of uses, um, conversion of M zone to um, residential or commercial overlay. Um, and uh, it, it just further underscores my concern, which you've heard frequently, about the use of IBZs for warehouse as opposed to, or city leases that have nothing to do with uh, industrial space. Um, uh, and um, I know we'll see one with the fire department um, that's similar in that it's an office space that has a particular use in a neighborhood with diminishing office space. And I just wonder, as part of the contemplation of an industrial policy, there can be some consideration of easing up on what, at least historically, was um, specs for warehouse space that only included ground floors. And maybe this speaks to the density question that Commissioner Della Ouse raised, but it seems to me that um, there are many good illustrations of uh, private leases that are on upper floors that meet all of those needs. I noticed that this is a ground floor space, and I do think it's harder to find ground floor space in an evacuation zone that's also not in a flood zone in the city of New York, but there are other ways to handle this, and I think with a little creativity, we actually have a far larger supply of industrial, of appropriate industrial supply, uh, industrial space. And I know that that isn't a question, but if I may respond for a moment, just to offer. Thank you. I'm happy to make it into a question. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want to hear me again. <laughs> Why do I ask? <laughs> um, so yes, you are correct about the leveling, ground floor, second floor. I want to bring it right back to this particular application. The New York City Emergency Management Operation, and um, sorry, with due to some snafus, our boards are not here. Our pictures would be very telling. Very large equipment very large trucks, et cetera. Upper floor observa uh, operations only, even with loading docks, would be very difficult, maybe for, for dry storage, but in the immediate response to deploy, as quickly as the deployment must happen, the way that the trucks must come and go, it would be challenging to the operation to bring things down and up. Additionally, this building, um, 
is not just ground floor. It's actually quite interesting. The slope of the street causes a ground floor large corner parking, uh, outdoor lot, and then a single story. At the back of the building, however, <coughs> it's actually two stories. Yeah, so it raises. So we actually, in this building, get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there is an intern mezzanine as well. So once again, the very difficult search, very limited parameters, uh, restrictive parameters. Um, this site was not originally on our radar, although to answer an earlier question of yours or a clarification, um, o OEM, uh, NYC, Emergency Management, now, na now known as, um, has been in this building since about 2008 with 96,000 square feet, only a portion of it. There was another tenant. However, after Sandy, that tenant, which was an ambulatory uh, ambulance uh, related organization, they left. So the, that, the expansion portion that we're looking to acquire under this application has been vacant for quite some time. So even with the Bushwick market, um, you know, resilience, this is a, um, a very peculiar indication where you have available space, but there's nothing happening with it. So we actually looked elsewhere, and then we returned to this based on the very difficult search we were having. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Uh, you know, uh, given the, the unique parameters of this, uh, the needs for this um, particular um, use, and they're not going away. You know, they, we continue to, we will continue to have these needs in, in perpetuity, I, I presume. So, you know, sort of back to this question, um, you know, it, it seems to me we're, we're in a position where the landlord understands um, how desperately we need this space and this particular use there, and perhaps that informed the negotiations and, and why we ended up where we're at, but, you know, why wouldn't we then um, explore um, acquisition and purchase, um, either negotiated or friendly or non-friendly, um, given the you know in perpetuity needs of of the city? Yeah. So uh, from the friendly, we'd like a um, an option to purchase this if you're marketing it for sale, flat out. Forget about the lease. We'd like to buy it. All of that conversation just went nowhere. He was not in a position to want to sell okay, to so the city. Unfriendly. Having said that, yes, having said <laughs> that, to the less friendly buyer, and, and I do want to qualify, many of you have probably been involved in eminent domain actions of condemnation. They're not always adverse. Sometimes it is an action both parties agree to do. There is something, let's, I, I really would like to do this, but Commissioner Gwek, you open the can of worms. Let's talk about money for a moment. In an eminent domain condemnation proceeding, the value of the asset is going to be rated at fair market. Whether or not that's best use, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of things go into it. We won't get into that in this dialogue. Having said that, right. let's hark back to what I said. The action of eminent domain condemnation is always on the table. While we certainly would like to see this market continue and our economy be as robust as it is, in the event that the market flatlines, takes a turn. The act of eminent domain is always, eminent domain is always on the table. And the pricing, if the market shifts, may be in our favor. Yeah, but I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, we've we've set the market price now. Well, so we set the value. We set the valuation based on the uh, on the eleven million dollar number on the cash flow. So uh, I think that we've done ourselves a disservice if we're gonna look at eminent domain in the future because we've already created a valuation, which I don't want to state on the record what I think it would be based on eleven million dollars, but. Um, there is a, a higher valuation than it would have warranted had it just been for the straight industrial manufacturing use that it was uh, that it's zoned for currently. So. so there's another dialogue following this that perhaps uh, one day, without a conflict of interest, uh, we can get together and chat about the strategy on how that works and the definition of fair market value having no floor and no ceiling. Right, and going back to future conversations, as you said, without a conflict of interest. We've had this conversation at, at the commission many times, and I think you were part of it, and, and, and your agency certainly. Well, I think overall we need to assess the needs of the city and see how we can stop being renters and start being buyers. It's, you know, we're grown up enough, it's, it's time for us to, to buy our own home. And uh, all these agencies uh, are, are 
we're growing and the city's growing and, and, and for the most part, uh, I think uh, the rental, I look at the, the option for the city to rent space is only as a, a TLC has a temporary issue, they need to rent space, that's something that's gonna come up once in a while, but we always need to plan, we're a planning commission, plan for the future and, and emergency management will always be in business. I mean, we hope to have no emergencies, but they're there just for that. It's like life insurance, we don't wanna use it, but it's there just in case. And uh, for, for the capital planning of the city, which this, this agency, is, is the commission and the agency have been involved in recently, we need to start looking at the needs, the long-term needs of the city's real estate instead of renting and putting our money towards purchasing and uh, getting a better deal for all New Yorkers. Yes, I don't think anyone disagrees. I do think that a healthy portfolio for any corporation, including the city of New York as a corporation, if you will, is a balance of, mix, of lease and owned and uh, there are very specific reasons why you would own and also why you would lease. So um, when we say that we, would, we should start doing it, um, since I have been aboard in 2014, I know we are starting. We have started. And that dialogue will continue perhaps in the past with many of you still um, on this commission. Perhaps it was a different administration or it was a different time, a different appetite for the city as to whether or not we wanted to acquire. But that dialogue uh, and conversation is robust and uh, many of our senior managers are participating. No, and we don't, I, don't want, I don't want to shoot the messenger. You've always been uh, a, a good uh, conveyor Thank of you. facts to the commission. Thank you. Thank you. I would also note that um, there has been a lot of discussion about the industrial space in Bushwick, and the department is taking a look, engaging with the community in Bushwick, including about the industrial space. And so I think we have an opportunity for a more holistic discussion about this as the as the land use, as the planning work proceeds. Commissioner Madi. Ms. Lazza, good morning. Good morning. So throughout the testimony, I've heard that, you know, the, the consideration for the space is because you want to be out of the flood zone. You know, they need to be uh, 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 quickly accessible during any emergencies. But I also just heard you say that the ambulance service left after Superstorm Sandy. So what, I guess my question would be, why did the ambulance service leave, and if and do those factors around which the ambulance service left affect the operations that are going to be placed in the building today? That's a good question. I can't answer specifically why they left. I don't have an insight into their business. But I don't believe that it was an ambulance, an ambulance service that was actually, um, uh, for example, how our emergency services, that division that rolls into the FDNY, how they deploy to supplement hospitals. They deploy the ambulances for different catchment areas. That's how uh, FDNY EMS works. I think this, um, I don't believe that it was an active deployment. Um, I'm not sure what really their operations were. I guess the concern, the concern isn't really around why they left, but more over were any of the factors of them leaving going to affect the operations of the New York City Emergency Management operations? It's only beneficially in that the space is now available for this expansion. Okay, thank you. We'll have another opportunity to hear Ms. Lazarson on the next <laughs> item, but with respect to this one. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we have Mr. James McConnell from Emergency Management available for That's questions. questions uh, from Thank you. Um, I'll note that those are the only speakers on this item, but as always, I'll ask if there's anyone in the audience who would want to be heard. If not, the public hearing is closed. Borough of Queens, calendar number 43, Community District 12, C150395, PQQ, a public hearing in the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning All My Children Daycare Center. Allison Grant from ACS is registered to speak, and uh, Ms. Lazarson, who can't get enough of us, is available for questions. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Start. My name is Allison Grant. I'm the Chief of Staff for Early Care and Education at the Administration for Children's Services. Um, Madam Chair, this is our first time meeting, so I thought I would just give a very brief 30-second overview of our work mm -hmm. to couch you. I know you received a presentation from Deputy Commissioner Gibson last month about the work of ACS in early childhood, but I just wanted to give a quick programmatic update. So our division, um, we have the largest subsidized child care system in the country. We serve over 100,000 children from ages 0 to 13 annually, and of those, about 40,000 are served via Early Learn, which is our contracted program. 
We serve children in about 380 programs, 76 of which are city leases, which is why I have the honor of presenting to all of you on a somewhat regular basis. It's good to see you. So with that, um, I'm happy to take more questions and I'm gonna present on the specific site. So I'm here today in favor of the continued use of this space at 117-16 Sutphin Boulevard as a daycare center. As many of you know, the space was designed specifically for the child care services to be there. Um, ACS has been in the space for 22 years, since May 1st of 1995, and we are the 100% occupant of this program space, and of the building, I should say. The current contractor that's there is named All My Children. They've been there since October of 2012. It's a child care program, meaning that all families there are um, at less than 200% of the poverty level and have a reason for care, meaning they work or they're in school or in a training program, or perhaps they're homeless or looking for work. So these are families in need. Um, at the time, there are about uh, 46 children in, that are enrolled, meaning the site is almost fully enrolled, which is quite an accomplishment for August, as you all know. Um, school and early childhood tends to have lower enrollment in, in August because of the summer. So um, this is a site that very much um, continues to need, a community that continues to need the service, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Questions for Ms. Grant? Okay, questions for Ms. Lazarson. Thank you. If not, I'll ask if there are others in the audience who would want to be heard. So the public hearing on this is closed. Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 44 and 45. Community District 12, number 44, C170336 ZMQ, calendar number 45, N170337 ZRQ, a public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning map and zoning text amendment concerning the Northeastern Towers Annex rezoning. Mr. De La Ouse is recused. And I would note for those who have entered the room after the start of the meeting that speakers are limited to three minutes. So with that, Mr. Plotnick. Good morning. Nice to see you, Madam Chair. Nice to see everybody. I hope the summer continues to go well. Uh, we're here today for a very uh, enthusiastic and positive application. I think it checks all the boxes that everybody's been looking to check these days in trying to provide affordable senior housing uh, for the aging population. As I'm about to turn 50, I'm coming up on this. Uh, the, the housing that we're proposing here is a rezoning from an R3X district to an R6 <laughs> zoning district. It's on Guy Brewer Boulevard in, uh, in Southeastern Queens in Community District 12. Uh, it's brought on behalf of the Northeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, members whom of, which, of which of whom are here today with us to speak. It's also brought by the Fifth Avenue Committee, which is a well-known not-for-profit organization providing affordable housing that's really uh, struck their roots in Brooklyn and is now venturing over to foreign lands, such as Queens. So now that we're in Queens, uh, we've been well supported by Community Board 12. There's been a few people at the board, on the board members that did object, but overwhelmingly it was supported. We worked with them for a year and a half. It's been supported by the councilman when he was there, and now it's sort of lacking a councilman. It's been well supported by the borough president, Melinda Katz, who issued a million dollars to us, uh, I think, just a few days ago, or at the beginning of July, as a grant towards this application, uh, the housing. And it's also been granted a million dollars from the Queen's delegation. Uh, towards the housing. So everything that's going on here is very well supported and very positive. What we're proposing to do is to create a 10-story, 128,000 square foot Sarah Ayers development. It, when it's completed, it'll be a total of 106 feet in height. It'll complement the existing building that you see there on the far left picture, which is an existing 12-story, uh, 110 foot building that also already accommodates seniors over the age of 62. It's a Section 202 HUD supportive housing uh, facility. And I'll let Jay, who's with the Fifth Avenue Committee, go through all of the different financing sources. Uh, as far as the amenities that go into it for the seniors, there's a lot. And I'll just list the rooms just so you can understand. There are two community rooms. Uh, there's one community room that's just going to be made available to the actual community. There's a senior center within the building. Uh, there's courtyards all over the place. There's rooftop gardens on the building. The building has been designed in a, fourth, in a way that it steps up, or I'm pointing here from the adjacent single family homes that are here, starts at four stories over here, and then builds its way up to its highest crescendo as it moves away from the single family homes. As you can see from the aerial, this site over here is a DEP uh, facility that's a big open area on the surface. I'm sure there's some underground work there where DEP has. So across the street is Rochdale Village. 
uh, which is a, a facility of 100 acres, it's a housing development of 100 acres uh, with buildings that rise as tall as 14 stories. So in overall, what I'm trying to communicate to you is that the building that we're proposing will complement the existing senior housing building on the lot already. It's much needed and much demand. It'll uh, allow the R6 district that's across the street to carry over to our site. Uh, it will allow for much needed affordable senior housing. I should mention that HPD has been, in, we've been in talks with HPD. We are providing a, a total of 147 units. And of those units, it's primarily, it is all studios and one bedrooms. You'll hear later, I know there was some question, why there are no two bedrooms. And we'll have, uh, Jay will speak to that in a second. And that's been the result of discussions with HPD. So I'm happy to answer any questions as we progress. I think I got most of the salient facts in. Commissioner Dweck. Yeah, hi, good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just a question. So the existing building, that's a, a non-conforming use? Yeah, the existing building, this building was built in the early 80s. There was, it was a, when it was built, it was allowed. Uh, then there was a down zoning that took place in 2005, the Springfield Gardens rezoning, and that made the existing building a non-compliant building. It was an R32 district before, and due to the size of the property and the fact that R32 doesn't have a height limit on it, right. uh, it was able to be constructed. Got it. Well, I mean, it certainly looks contextual, what you're looking for from... Yeah, it's like definitely contextual to these properties. Right. Of course, the single family's homes is the elephant in the room, but... Uh, everybody that we spoke to and everybody that's worked on has agreed that what's going on in the buildings is well worth uh, any potential imposition from adding another building. And Stu Markowitz, the project architect, is here. He'll go through it with you. He really designed it very nicely, the way the building uh, wraps around here. You can see it right here in these images. Uh, this is it here. And he sort of created a campus-like environment that's uh, going to be very good for the residents. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Good morning. Hi. You mentioned the architect is coming up? Yes. Do more okay, questions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He's here. Other questions for Mr. Palatnik? Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Our next speaker is Bruce Markowitz. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so, um, if it's okay, I'll, since uh, Eric gave a, a broad outline of the, of the approach to the design, I just want to give you a couple of facts and figures about the existing project and, 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 and the proposed project that's presented today. The existing building, as I said, is a 12-story building. It has 111 units in it. Um, there are 11 studios, um, 88 one-bedrooms, and uh, 12 two-bedrooms, one of which is for the building super, resident superintendent, but 11 are, um, are accessible uh, units that were they were designed. The original building was a uh, Section 202 project uh, built with HUD uh, mortgage insurance, and, um, and, and it, back in the early 80s, before cost containment guidelines came into effect, they were allowed to have two-bedroom apartments. And the uh, and the and the Northeastern Conference thought it was a good idea, and, and they still like the idea of having uh, two-bedroom accessible units, so that. Uh, uh, if you have a caregiver that needs to stay or even a couple that, that does need separate bedrooms, that they would be provided. Our original design for the building, uh, and I know there was a question that came up on this, so I would like to address it, um, had 130 units, um, 17 of which were similar accessible two-bedroom units. Um, HPDs, um, uh, because due to the programmatic requirements of, of the SARA program, um, is um, objected to the two bedrooms as not fitting in their program while we're still in conversations with them. Um, we have retained the, the overall volume and bulk of uh, the, that allowed us to include those two bedrooms and, and so therefore we changed the two bedroom units to two, one bed, two studio units uh, and, and kept the volume. That's, that's where the, the change in numbers that you may have seen in, in, the, uh, in the documents came, came from. Uh, while we're while we're still uh, discussing the issue with HPD, um, uh, as um, as Eric mentioned, the uh, the design of the building is is is, is set the uh, uh, set the building along the southern edge of the property, facing the open uh, DEP property. We've uh, as part of the design, we've also relocated the vehicular access to the intersection of 161st and 131st. Um, to make that intersection safer, and um, I will take uh, any questions that you might have. 
Questions from commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, Clark, you are the architect. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I noticed you have some first floor units. Um, I'm curious about sort of the condition of, you know, wh whether there's some distance from the sidewalk, what kind of um, sort of privacy we are able to give folks who end up living in the first floor because they're not raised correct yeah they are raised it's not a ra oh okay it's yeah, I don't, they're raised, I they're raised from um, they're raised from 100 and, uh, uh, 132nd Avenue uh, the, the, I'll, I'll use my finger to draw a little bit the, if you could um, bring the microphone the, over with your oh, sure yeah, thank you uh, the first floor on Dyer Brewer Boulevard, the busier street, that's uh, that's proposed for the senior center. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and those uh, are at grade. I'm sorry. And those windows are at grade. No, so those are those are close. Those are close to grade. Um, the the site slopes to the south, and and the first floor is approximately three feet uh, over the over the 132nd Street, you know, elevation at the mid at mid block. And the, and the apartments are located in the western side of the, uh, of the first floor. Um, and and there, are, there are a few on, on, on that floor. Um, the, 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 rest of the rest of the first floor is common area and, um, and management space. I, there are apartments facing 132nd Avenue, Yes, right? yes, yes. Okay. And, they, and, they are, and they are raised up off uh, off, off the uh, elevation, the, the sidewalk at, at 132nd is lower than, than, than the rest of the site. It's and just it's a gradual slope, but it is slow. Are you intending to put some sort of landscaping yes, or some sort yes, of barrier? Yes, there, there, there will be. What is the what is the barrier? What will the condition at the street for not just the folks well, who well, are inside, we, but we've, also we've, the pedestrians? We've, we've um, set back the building 20 feet, and, and we will be landscaping that, that front yard. I saw in one of the renderings there's a very high fence, um, and I understand it's for illustrative purposes only. But I, I was confused as to. Um, the, well, there is a um, there is a, a, a metal there is a metal fence now around the around the site, um, and we. But uh, the, in the in the illustration of the new construction. Uh, this fence. I can't see. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I, I'm, I'm just curious because in, in the rendering that I'm, I'm looking at, it just, uh, it, of the view from 161st Street and 132nd Avenue, looking east, um, you know, the fence it looks like a really tall, high fence that, you know, I, I, I guess the issue is that as a pedestrian, also you don't want to feel like you're walking down a street where. You've got. Oh well, a, there, there, there was know, there was no intention to, to change the nature of, of the fencing on the rest of the property. Um, and, and, and let me let me pull this down. Please. It's this rendering right here. The bottom. No, 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 that one right there. That one. Yeah, yeah. This one? Yeah, it, it, it's actually. It's if a, you could put it up put for it all up. the, the sure. commissioners to see. Absolutely. It was it was the fence similar to what's uh, okay. to what's there now. Okay, so there's there's no plan to remove or change that fence. Well, there, there'll be construction. It'll be, re, re, be re, re, okay. replaced. Okay, so I'm just wondering, um, you know, is that for security reasons? I mean, why would we want an incredibly tall fence for the pedestrian who walks by? Um, you know, it, it it just adds to sort of a, you well, know, sense of it's insecurity, it's right? It's I mean, sometimes fences make you feel less secure because you feel like there's a need to I mean, is there an issue of security in this area? Why wouldn't we have, you know, simply landscaping that's attractive um, versus a, you know, tall fence and the way it looks here? It looks like a barrier, you know. Well, I guess it originally, originally it was. Um, I, I don't say I'd be happy to discuss that with the, the conference and talk about it. It strikes me that this will be of interest in the post-hearing review. Do you want to continue, Commissioner Ortiz? Well, I'd like to ask the question in a, in a, in a different way because from the, I understand where, where Commissioner Ortiz is, why she's asking the question, because the fence looks, at, it's passing the first floor window, so we're going to assume, what, eight, nine feet there? Oh, no. So the better question oh. would be is, 
how high is the existing fence, and are you going to match the existing fence height? The, well, the original, you know, I, would, I, would, I guess I would say that this was a, um, um, it was done with the thought of continuing what they, what they had. But uh, the fence is, um, I believe, um, five or six feet now, and, and it would be the same. May look different, but, um, but, it's, but certainly, certainly, it's, I think it's an excellent point, and it's worth it's worth reviewing with the uh, with the owners to be about reducing or eliminating. Yeah, I mean, I would I would encourage that in yeah. order to you know I mean we are trying to create point. more of a neighborhood feeling and and you know I understand issues and concerns about safety, so those need to be taken into account. But um, you know, to the extent that we can um, make a neighborhood feel. A little more comfortable. You, you know, the the, the, um, uh, the the fence runs around to the to, to the front entrance. You can't see it because there's a there's a car in the way. But those gates are there are gates, but they're never they're never closed. Um, yeah. Uh, and so um, um, I, I I think it's an excellent point, and we'd be happy to happy to go over that with the owners. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Markowitz? Thank you. Our next speaker is Jay Martin. Hi, good morning. Um, so uh, we're very happy to be part of the development team. Fifth Avenue Committee is a 39-year-old nonprofit community development corporation that, in addition to doing affordable housing, also does job training, adult literacy education, and community advocacy. Um, and we're very excited now to be partnering with NEC in our first venture, as Eric mentioned, in Queens. Uh, because the need is so severe in Queens, and it's severe, uh, particularly for seniors. So we're pleased about NEC looking to expand their existing 202 to include these additional 147 units. Um, the 147 units will 109 one bedrooms and 37 studios. We do slant more towards the one bedroom for the issue that Eric mentioned before. We really want this to be about allowing people to age in place. So we have the community room, the wellness room, which will also have a waiting area. It's meant for the medical staff um, to be able to, so that medical services can be brought in. We have an exercise room, we have a library room, we have a computer room, we have a community room, and then separately, uh, working in conjunction with the three senior centers that are within half a mile, we have 3,900 square feet that we're gonna be planning generally for senior for senior services that the senior centers work with us on identifying that they're not able to provide there that we'll provide here. So we really want to make sure this is helping people in the community and here age in place. Uh, similar to the to the rest of the city, the senior population here is growing. It's the fastest growing demographic in community board 12 and the poverty rate is the highest among single seniors in community board 12 of any demographic group. It's 33%. Um, is the poverty rate, and 74% of the single seniors in this community district um, also uh, pay, are below 50% of median, which is our target here for the population. Um, we applaud also, we're very happy to have the city here today, and, and they were been a great partner with us in, in working out how best to do senior housing and the SARA program is a very new, excited program where uh, we're pleased to be a part of uh, one of their uh, earlier projects. Um, so um, I do want to address the, the two issues that were raised. Um, interestingly, on the, you know, previously this is across from a, um, from a DEP site and this has been more parking before. So you're right, we hadn't thought enough about the streetscape, and now that we're gonna have residential units on there, how we should uh, look at the streetscape. Interestingly, Council Member Richards, we've been meeting with council members about this, um, and he raised the same point. So we will be looking at what a good appropriate design is now that we'll be having residential on this side of, this side of the street there. Um, and I do wanna address the two bed, I'll be very I, I think you'll get a question. Okay. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Levin. Thank you, Jay. Welcome back. Um, nice to see you. And since this was a question that I asked on Monday, I'll take the opportunity to ask you to talk a bit about um, having had to drop the two-bedroom unit. Um, seems like. 
like there is a need in the community for units of that size. Uh, how do you balance all the people pushing that here to get to a footprint here? And how does it relate to the existing community? Do you maybe have some flexibility in your balancing system to really put in the existing buildings to meet the need that we heard about in the public comment? Um, on the latter point, we, that's not something we thought about, and maybe we should look at it. Um, I do know they just went through a major renovation, and also I'm not sure in the context of the high demand they're willing to have fewer units, which creating two bedrooms means, but it's definitely something to look at. I, I think the idea is that we want to be uh, as creative as we can here in meeting the needs. So we, we slant it to the one bedrooms so they can be space for the caregivers. I think we want to be speaking about how we design the one bedrooms um, to try to make sure that they can be a, sometimes you have a separate dining area, but maybe there's a way to create instead that that's kind of a nook for the caregiver uh, to have some privacy. And again, for 24-hour caregivers, which they do now finding they're having in some of the 202 units, we want to make sure we accommodate here. Maybe we make sure some of those units are large enough. Um, the HPD guidelines do allow for somewhat larger units, both for studios up to 450 square feet instead of 400, and the one bedrooms larger uh, for disabled, and we are doing a higher percentage disabled. Um, it, it, we're doing over, I know it's over 10%, I'm not sure the exact percent, but I think that'll also help us to be able to arrange to have some of those, those spaces available for caregivers. Um, so I think we're gonna, I think within the existing HPD SARA guidelines, we're gonna be able to accommodate that need for the caregiver. It's gonna be just require a little more creativity. This site doesn't enable us on another site we're doing senior housing. We actually are, almost all of them are at the 400 square feet or 450 for the uh, disabled and we're able to do kind of a, a where they're L-shaped um, to allow that privacy even in the studios. Um, this site doesn't necessarily lend itself as much to that, but again, I do think there are other creative ways we'll work with Stu. Stu's been extremely creative. I mean, I do want to mention we did spend a good year with the community before we certified Euler, um, and that in, that's the reason why there's very few shadows to single family homes in only, I think, one season. Um, and, and it's why we also were able to accommodate the community's other concerns related to garbage and parking. Uh, Commissioner Arpa. I wanted to commend you on um, addressing the need of the other seniors, particularly those coming out of um, Rochdale Village and the other senior centers. I, I think this is the first time we've really seen that degree of thoughtfulness about the other need, the needs, social service needs of other residents other than the ones in that building. Um, I did have a question about the length of affordability under Sarah. How long um, term are these apartments? Um, well, I, Fifth Avenue Committee is part of its mission, and this very much matches NEC, is dedicated to permanent affordability. So we are, we are going to seek to have that in the regulatory agreement. Um, and I don't know what AIRS uh, requires in terms of that, and I also don't know what Sarah, uh, I don't recall if Sarah is 30 or 60 years, Jen? Uh, 30. 30, but again, we will... What, you know, we had this with the library project we heard too. We are dedicated to permanent affordability. As many of the units that we can to get in a regulatory agreement, we're very happy to have that happen. Um, but otherwise, we'll, we'll provide other written documentation for the permanent affordability. It, it's been a part of Fifth Avenue Committee's mission, and it's been something that we've insisted on all of our projects, I think, um, back, back at least 10 years or so. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Our next speaker is Gail Thomas. Good morning. I am the present manager of Northeastern Towers. I've been there for the past 20 years, 18 serving as the service coordinator and for the past two years as the manager. So I've been around for a little while to know the climate <laughs> of the area and we currently on average get five calls a day, which turns out to be 25 calls a week, which goes into 100 calls a month, 
which turns out to be 1,200 calls a year. <laughs> That's not counting the waiting list of over 500 people and the people that are still mailing in applications even though we have told them we are currently closed and are not taking applications anymore. So to say that this is a demand it would be a gross understatement. Our environment provides for 24-hour security, and our fence, Commissioner Ortiz, that you were concerned about, is very much wanted by our seniors to the point where we have promised them that the new facility will not disturb the current fence because we have parking there. We have, we have a parking lot, and tenants are allowed to park their cars there, and we promised them a new fence that would be automated. <laughs> so they wouldn't have to get out like they currently do. Get out, I've gotten the phone calls at one o'clock in the morning. Ms. Thomas, can you please let the security guard know by my quadriplegic tenant who still drives, can you please open up the fence so that I can get in? So they are very much um, wanting their fence back. <laughs> it also gives them a sense of security because we have 24 hour security, laundry service, and our invaluable service coordinator that we presently have that helps them with everything from everything, everything. With the ambulance callers, the social security um, helpers, the food stamp helpers, everything, you name it, basically almost adopted family, we are there for them. And that's what they greatly look forward to and greatly need and appreciate. I know that there was, I've heard that there was concerns about, a two, about our two bedroom apartments. We currently have three families that have handicapped children whose parents are taking care of them. Yesterday when I went to do apartment inspection, we have a 30 year old tenant who has the mind capacity of a three to six year old and his mom is taking care of him. We have a couple of tenants like that. And in order to give the parent space and the child space, who was actually the, the reason why they were able to get a handicapped apartment, because he is the handicapped person, well, they are the handicapped person, um, it's very much needed. So, thank we you. We really appreciate whatever you can do. And thank you for what you do. <laughs> Questions for Ms. Thomas? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is the Reverend, Reverend Daniel Honore. Good morning. My name is Daniel Honore. I'm the president of the Northeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. We are a religious organization composed of about 200 congregations most of them in the metropolitan New York area. We operate about 15 elementary schools and two high schools here in New York. We have a community center that feeds over 800 families every month in Corona. And for more than 30 years, we have sponsored the Northeastern Towers. Those who came before us saw the need to provide affordable housing to senior citizens. And as Gail mentioned, for more than 30 years, that has been our mission. But now we have a five-year waiting list. And there is a need in the community. And what I appreciate most about this project, as someone on the board mentioned, is the possibility of having a community service center that will be open to our seniors, not only the residents of the current tower and the new tower, but even others in the community who may need services for the day. And so that is our motivation, to serve the need of our population and to meet a need that actually exists in the community. We believe that this will also help our community by creating hundreds of jobs in a depressed community, both short-term through construction and long-term, because now providers will have employment opportunities with the new facility. So that is our reason for being here, and we thank you for your consideration. Questions for Reverend Honoré? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Emmanuel Kokonakis.
Hi, I'm Manuel Kokonakis with Mega Contracting. We're part of the development team and the contractor for this project. Uh, quickly about our company, we've been around for over 25 years with a specialty and expertise in affordable housing and happy to answer any construction related questions. Questions? Thank you. And we now have available for any questions, Christina McCallion from Philip Habib Associates. Thank you. And our final person available for questions is Jenna Brees from HPD. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Um, Jenna, I don't have specific questions for um, this project, but you've taken the time to come today. I wonder if you could give us a little overview about um, senior projects um, after the zoning for quality and affordability, the creation of new flexibility for AIRS projects and the center programming. And um, are we seeing these kinds of projects emerge around the city? Is it working the way the city hoped it might? Uh, yes, I think that um, the creation of the SARA program, which was then followed by the ZQA changes and the new definition of senior housing in the zoning resolution as heirs housing, which includes a zoning bonus and some other um, zoning benefits, has definitely um, been um, resulted in a program that is extremely popular. We get numerous um, uh, new proposals. Uh, we have been exceeding our um, uh, our goal of doing 500 units per year every year. I think last year we did, uh, I think it was 650, 675. Um, so, you know, we are basically, if we had all of the funding in the world and our, our um, partnering agencies uh, such as the HTC and HFA and the tax credits. I mean, if money was no object, we would be doing um, a num you know, untold numbers of units. So there's been a huge interest in the program. Um, and you know, I think part of that is coming from not-for-profits such as Fifth Avenue Committee um, and other not-for-profits that have had this sort of pent-up demand to, that are responding to pent-up demand to do senior housing after the federal government stopped funding new senior housing projects. There hasn't been any new funding for HUD 202s in five or six years. Um, and then there are also for-profit developers who are also interested in the program um, because I think the zoning bonus and the other incentives uh, really make it attractive. So. Um, we are really excited because, as everyone who has spoken so far has said, there is a huge need for this type of housing. Um, it's great to hear some of the specific numbers about the need in this community. We know citywide, we are, uh, we're hearing that there, we, the total number of folks on waiting lists for 202s is approximately 200,000 people. So um, you know, our term sheet limits uh, unit sizes to studios and one bedrooms. Um, this is also what um, the HUD 202 program had limited unit sizes to, but it was good to know that that was a change that happened in the early 80s. I wasn't aware of that. But this enables us to try to develop as many of these units as possible for the folks who are really in need. So, um, you know, while we're sympathetic to um, the needs of <coughs> larger families with unique circumstances and the folks who need caregivers, um, we also think that it, in the end, it will be a benefit to be able to have a project with, you know, 15 or 16 additional units. Commissioner Cantor. Thank you. Um, do you have any guidelines for the uh, applicants with respect to uh, signage or to uh, graphics? Uh, in terms of what type of materials? Well, I wouldn't have asked you this question a year or so ago, but um, having learned by being here this past year, uh, signage is a problem for elderly people simply because the uh, greens on blues, the reds on blues, the blues on reds make it very difficult for many of us to see adequately. In addition to that, with respect to signage, when you get down to the smaller types, the smaller fonts, it's another issue for elderly. 
And uh, as I say, having entered the elderly group some time ago, I'm becoming more and more aware of it, and I'm wondering whether there are any guidelines. So um, all HPD projects have to follow uh, federal and state and local accessibility requirements. Uh, HPD projects also have to meet uh, the Enterprise Foundation's Green Community Standards, which includes, um, in addition to um, uh, physical requirements to make the building efficient, is that the standard is now starting to incorporate certain types of uh, wellness requirements. So I'm not sure if, um, specific, if there are specific requirements with respect to signage, but um, a lot of the developers that are working with us are, are experienced affordable housing providers and senior housing providers. Uh, so we expect that they are going, you know, that they have the expertise to ensure that the residents can navigate the building well. And um, there will also be, so the city just released a, a, a request for proposals to provide services to these buildings from HRA. So there will also be senior service providers with expertise in working with this population. And so those folks will be definitely involved in um, the, some of the materials that are distributed to seniors in terms of information about um, you know, events for residents and uh, uh, education and other types of assistance. Well, we know from past experience there are always some forward-looking builders, developers, et cetera, who can address these issues when they think about it. But um, I think the city and state and federal government are replete with literature, if you will, um, for every kind of activity that they can think of. And I'm concerned that they are not yet, not yet thinking of these issues. And they probably won't think of those issues until some of them get old enough to say, why didn't we do? So I would ask or urge that some consideration be given in formulating minimum standards for those, at least those two areas. Um, I will look into it and uh, find out if that's something we already have in place. And if Thank not, you. I will definitely um, pass your suggestion along. Thank you. And yes, Commissioner, our post-hearing review, we can have um, information submitted to us about what the current requirements are, and we hear your request for a forward look. Other questions? <coughs> Thank you. We do not have any other speakers on this topic, but if there's anyone in the audience who would want to chime in, raise your hand. So the public hearing is closed. We can uh, ask Commissioner De La Luz to come back into the hearing room. And for second call in the borough of Brooklyn, calendar number 40, Community District 2, N180016 PXK a public hearing in the matter of a notice to intend to acquire office space for the New York Fire Department. Our first speaker is Michael Hannon. Um, good morning, Chairperson, uh, Madam Chairperson and members of the Planning Commission. Um, I do apologize for my delay in, in a trick. Case of true irony, the fire alarm went off at headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Um, my name is Michael Hannon. I'm Director of Support Services for the Fire Department. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to appear before you um, this morning and testify on this important issue. As part of the Charter Mandated 195 application process, the Fire Department is seeking to secure additional administrative space at one Pierpont Plaza in Brooklyn Heights to rectify overcrowded conditions at our nine Metro Tech headquarters. As you may know, Fire Headquarters was relocated to Metro Tech in 1998. However, over the past 19 years, primarily due to operational changes and additional agency responsibilities, the department has outgrown this space. Specifically, these responsibilities include, but not, are not limited to, an increase in staffing in our Bureau of Fire Prevention, technical ownership of our Bureau's emergency medical services computer-aided dispatch system, and our medical monitoring program for current and retired members who operate at the World Trade Center site. Another important factor in this outgrowth was the post-9-11 expansion to our headquarters-based operations center. This state-of-the-art facility consumed more than 20,000 square feet of space at 9 Metro Tech. It's important to note that this round-the-clock staff center provides the agency with enhanced capabilities of managing emergency responses as well as other catastrophic events. 
One of the more recent increases to tax our available space within the fire department was the need to increase um, recruitment staff from a court ordered monitor um, put in place to assist with our diversity efforts. Over the past years, the agency was able to absorb these additional increases by one, reducing individual cubicle sizes, two, conversion of conference rooms to accommodate more cubicles in offices, three, relocation of paper files off site to uh, convert to office space, and lastly, staggering work schedules to accommodate more in limited space. Unfortunately, we have now reached the point where expansion in our current location is no longer possible. The one Pier Pump Plaza site, which is only four blocks from Nine Metrotech, will serve as the new home for our Bureau of Fire Prevention District Offices 1 and 3 and our Bureau of Human Resources. Finally, the vacated space um, at Metrotech will allow expansion of our Bureau of Technology Development for that CAD system referred to earlier, as well as, well as our recruitment staff. Um, I'm happy uh, and thankful for this opportunity to speak before you and to any questions you may have. Commissioner Arfa. Thank you. I'm, I'm <coughs> delighted to know it was only an, an error in the fire uh, alarm and not something more serious. And thank you for coming. Um, and thank you for addressing the specific needs um, of the expansion. As I said at the review session, you might be aware, um, there's a limited amount of office space built in downtown Brooklyn. And it was anticipated that that would become our second or third downtown in New York or Central Business District. Um, and this is a fairly large block of office space in a very limited supply. So I just wonder, um, not to deny the absolute need of each of these, and as a citizen, I'm delighted to hear um, just how uh, granular and um, uh, forward-thinking these departments are that you've described. But uh, do do all of them have interaction with the Metrotech, the personnel at Metrotech, or are some of these um, possibly satellite offices in another part of the city? Um, primarily, the the human resources is um, in constant contact with all different units within the department. Now, they were considered for moving because of the numbers and their ability to move as a whole unit. Mm -hmm. um, although they do need to stay close to fire headquarters to deal with our budget department and fire operations. So, so yes, the close proximity of Pierpont was important to us. Actually, we didn't identify Pierpont, but the the fact that we needed it to be close to nine Metrotech was a, a request on the department's behalf. Uh, so just to understand, um, the human resources is at uh, Metrotech. It's presently, excuse me. Uh, yes, it's presently at nine Metrotech. OK. And the monitoring service that you described, which is obviously a very important function, that's a requirement to be near well, um, Metrotech as well? Yes, because they're in constant communication with the medical staff. So as the monitoring goes on, um, they interact with medical, which is also um, at 9 Metrotech, to see when patients need to be called in, progress on, on people's health. So yes, there's, there's constant back and forth between the monitoring and medical services, although they're remaining at 9 Metrotech. Um, and I mean this with absolutely no disrespect, but are, are any of these functions capable of being handled um, via internet or other non-face-to-face -face means? I'm just trying to understand whether this is, um, and, and it's really more a case in point as opposed to um, necessarily specifically about this application. It's a broader question, and perhaps it's better answered by um, Del Lazerson or somebody else. Um, but, but how much of this is really face-to-face -face contact um, where physical proximity is needed versus some other form of communication? And uh, if it's a rhetorical question, I apologize. I'm just trying to get a better understanding. Um, the department considered other options, and, and, and um, we went through a lengthy process before we had put in our request. And um, because of the interaction between all of these units, although some may be able, these communications could happen over the internet in some cases, um, it was believed and it's still believed by our department that having headquarters operate as a whole together in unison is the best course of action in our operations. Um, we, did, we, we also looked at um, perhaps um, recruitment not having to be perhaps at 9 Metrotech. Um, but the court ordered, 
headquartered monitor ordered us that it had to be part of headquarters and not isolated somewhere else um, to ensure that we would get the response that we had wanted in terms of diversifying the department. So um, efforts were made to look elsewhere and to think out of the box, um, but because of operational concerns, we felt best that they remain in the same downtown Brooklyn area. Thank you. I appreciate it. Other questions for Mr. Hannon? Yes, Commissioner Levin. <laughs> I've been cut off here. Yeah. Um, I just can't resist asking, is this space that became um, recently available in the following the November election? As a matter of fact, it is, yes. <laughs> Great space. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your campaigns are more successful. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hannon. And um, the indefatigable Ms. Lazarson is here to answer any questions. Questions? Yes, Commissioner Afron. If there's anything you'd like to add to um, the response, the very comprehensive response from um, Mr. Hannon. Um, no, uh, it, was, it was tremendously uh, thorough. I will say we are very impressed as a result of the recent space assessment uh, study. We're very impressed with um, uh, FDNY's first take at trying to replan their own offices. Um, and use the existing conference rooms, et cetera, maybe downsize some of their workstation sizes, et cetera, before submitting a new need to DCAS to explore additional space. Um, so we, I will throw out that uh, thank you to the FDNY for their participation in our exercise. Um, and I would also like to speak about the vacancy, if I may. Downtown Brooklyn um, has uh, hanging around about a 5% vacancy in Class A, B, and C, so it is a very robust market. You're absolutely correct. This particular building um, was in front of you. The law department just leased space here on the 10th floor, which was also part of the former campaign. Uh, and the building actually, after uh, successful approval of this application, when we execute this lease, we'll have 30% vacancy because there is a large firm that is actually leaving the building. So I think the 5% vacancy in the overall market is probably clinging to just a few buildings. The market remains robust, which is nice to see. The city of New York also has owned property in this area. Mm -hmm. And I was looking forward to Commissioner Knuckles potentially asking this question. Um, we have the 209 and 210 Duralaman buildings. The city owns them. We also have 345 Adams. And I'd like to thank the commission because recently uh, having to reconfigure 210 Duralaman for the courts. Uh, we have office space there, and we are reconfiguring it to provide space for family courts, I believe. I'm not sure which division, but it is for the courts. We are moving city agencies out of 210, shuffling a little bit within to own properties. We're moving them over to 345 Adams. Thank you to the commission, because the Department of Finance is at 345 Adams, and you recently approved their consolidation into 375 Pearl here, making room for that. So we are looking at our own properties as well. And unfortunately, at this time, uh, those three properties don't provide an opportunity for the expansion here. Other questions? Sounds like part of your job is solving a Rubik's Cube <laughs> of space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Lazarson. Thank you. Those are the only speakers who are registered. If there's anyone else who would want to be heard, please let me know. The public hearing is closed. Any other business, Mr. Secretary? Uh, there is not. And we bring it in at noon. <laughs> Enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>